my talk today, uh, in, in starting out this symposium on where, where, do, we, where do we turn next, uh, seeks to answer this question, or at least provide my perspective on this matter, by looking at the issue of how to bring the military history of the First World War into greater dialogue with the history of imperialism. Um, my own work looks at the comparative, uh, uh, comparative imperialism in, in, in the British Empire. And I guess the question people ask is, well, are you a military historian or a British Empire historian? And my answer is generally, well, it depends on who's hiring. <laughs> but I think that uh, to a certain, certain extent, the history of the First World War, at least in the British, broader British experience, has lagged behind that of scholars of, say, the German Empire, the Russian Empire, the Ottoman Empire, in seeking to understand the war through the lens of comparative imperialism. <laughs> scholars of the British Empire certainly view the war as laying the foundation for decolonization, or at least a, a sort of uh, a starting place for talking about later developments in the 20th century. But I think the question we need to really be asking, and John and I were talking about this before the session this morning, uh, is the way in which the war did not necessarily mark a, a point of departure, but rather a, sort of a, a point of continuity, sort of evolution of the empire, if you will. And so to do that, we need to look at the intersection of military history and imperial history itself. Certainly, it is a war. This is a, 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 a military effort with the economic strangulation of Germany, the naval campaign, the, the, uh, the war on the Western Front, etc. But it was also a massive enterprise of seeking to sustain a global empire against dissent, against anti-colonialism, against socialism, etc. And in fact, a survey of the private records of those mandarins of power responsible for maintaining the empire demonstrates that they were as concerned with these social issues, Ireland, India, et cetera, as they were with the German army on the Western Front. Now, scholars of the British Empire typically ignore military history. I probably preached to the converted here. Uh, I gave a paper at the North American Conference on British Studies two years ago, which is the largest British history conference in the world. It had imperial defense on the panel title, and there were three people in the audience two of whom were my graduate students, the other my long-suffering wife. <laughs> but military, who left halfway through the panel. But military historians, too, I think, we, we collectively need to do a better job of reaching out and trying to incorporate our work into the broader history of empire. It was, uh, uh, in a recent edited collection, the naval historian Andrew Lambert wrote that, quote, military historians have to exploit the current interest in empires to join the debates bringing their own unique <coughs> insights and resources to bear. So my book project that I'm working on uh, and finishing the last elements of the research, hopefully in the next few days, uh, looks at the ways in which networks of imperial elites maintained the empire during the First World War. Focusing on the private relationships of a, of a transnational cast of personalities, uh, I'm looking at politicians, colonial administrators, businessmen, journalists, social activists, military officers, and how they worked through constitutional hurdles and a complete lack of precedent at the end of the day in order to manufacture a remarkably resilient wartime partnership. This represented a new, more malleable, and inherently cooperative form of imperial governance, one which sort of took the locus of power away from London and began to spread it throughout the empire. Now, obviously, Anglophone elites are at the vanguard of this project, and I've been working in the Billy Hughes papers for the last few days, and this is an example of the ways in which Dominion personalities are playing a more active role in the empire during the war. But we also need to recognize that this was a project of compromise and collaboration with non-Anglophone elites. And so bringing back into the picture people like John Redman of Ireland, uh, 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 Louis Botha of South Africa, or the Maharaja Ganga Sin of the Indian National Congress. Individuals who supported the war, not necessarily out of a sentimental or, or shall I be said, maybe racial attachment to empire, but as part of a pragmatic project of reorganization with the dream of a more decentralized empire. My paper today examines uh, one of the most important figures in this imperial project, the Afrikaner general Jan Christian Smuts. I want to look at Smuts today in the time that I have in sort of three different capacities. First, his military leadership, the role that Dominion figures, military officers, played in shaping both the war effort and military strategy. Second, his role in Dominion politics, the ways in which uh, Dominion statesmen had to navigate the sort of uh, 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 dichotomy between, between imperial politics 
and dominion or national politics. Becoming, as, as some of his uh, harshest critics would say, a collaborator in this project of empire. And third, and I think what's most important for us today, his active role in the highest councils of the British Empire. His position, for example, in the Imperial War Cabinet as the right-hand man of David Lloyd George and his dominating presence in the Paris Peace Conference of 1919 speaks to the ways in which these individuals, British, Australian, Canadian, Irish, Indian, tells us much about the way that the British Empire worked in an era of total war. And I should probably pull up my PowerPoint. <laughs> Smuts was born in 1870 uh, in the Cape Colony as a, in a family of well-to-do Boers. Uh, demonstrated considerable aptitude and, and originally wanted to be a Calvinist minister, but as he, he told an audience in 1905, reading Walt Whitman convinced him otherwise. And so in 1891, he went to Cambridge to study law. Now his days at Cambridge, ostensibly in the study of law, ultimately turned into a, a, a passion for philosophy, and indeed he wrote several monographs on philosophy and maintained vibrant conversations with his philosophy professors until their deaths in the 1920s. He became involved upon his return to South Africa in Cape politics where he urged a compromise between the two white populations of South Africa. Um, but the Jameson Raid of 1895 hardened his sentiments against what he saw as the overreach of British imperialism. And so not surprisingly, he took an active role in the South African War at first as an aide-de-camp uh, uh, to several Boer generals and then later as a, as, a, as a general in his own right. Smuts's ideas uh, about Boer nationalism, though, were somewhat different from some of his contemporaries in that he saw the war as, as, a, as a way to maintain the independence of the Boer states but to still try to bring some type of compromise, some type of racial reconciliation between white British and Boer populations in South Africa. Now, of course, he also maintains very, very racist attitudes, and this is something we can talk about in a few minutes. Uh, but the idea of nation building in South Africa is very much at the forefront of his philosophy and is going to motivate much of his later actions during the war. He also urged uh, uh, offensives into both the Cape Colony and Natal. He, he, he advocated uh, a more aggressive form of warfare from that of some of his other contemporaries. And in 1902, like his good friend Louis Botha, he was among those who urged peace and a return to the politics of compromise. In 1906, he helped to form the South African Party and played an instrumental role in the creation of the Union of South Africa. He was the Dominion's first defense minister and was responsible for creating the Union Defense Force. And, and his role in creating the UDF actually, I think, kind of speaks to his uh, uh, ideas of reconciliation, so much so that he maintained 50% of the officer positions for, for English-speaking officers, 50% for Boer uh, uh, officers. He, he tried to maintain as best as possible a balance between the two populations. And as the defense minister in 1912 to 1914, he, and harboring dreams of nation building, he began to prepare the Union Defense Force for a potentially offensive war against neighbor German territories. Now, Smuts's test as a Dominion politician came upon the outbreak of war in 1914 when he mobilized the UDF for operations into German Southwest Africa, but almost immediately faced a rebellion amongst a minority of the Boer population who wanted to use this as an opportunity to take South Africa out of the war and to proclaim a republic. Smuts's time during the uh, South African rebellion really speaks to the way in which how the empire relied on moderate nationalists in places like South Africa. Along with the prime minister, Louis Botha, pictured here, uh, uh, both figures worked through private channels and, and, and individual contacts to be able to attempt to, to clamp down on the rebellion, not as much through military force, although ultimately that's what's required, but rather through uh, negotiations with, with Boer rebels, the vast bulk of whom are former comrades during the South African War. Both himself took the field as a military commander, crushing one by one the various rebellious commandos, while Smuts was the workhouse at the Defense Ministry in Pretoria, often working 18 to 19 hours a day, firing off telegrams, 
uh, to various parts of the Dominion, working <coughs> with, the, with the, uh, the, the press and the media through censorship and trying to orchestrate the, 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 the various sort of intricate uh, systems of rail networks and whatnot required to bring this rebellion to bear. And so for two months, he worked with the governor general, he worked with his various military officers, and he worked with his prime minister, again through quiet backdoor negotiations. And so when one thinks about the successes of, of crushing the rebellion in 1914, one typically attributes this to Botha, who is actually taking the field against the commandos. But much of the actual work being done is being done by Smuts. The governor general, uh, uh, Sidney Boxton, who had arrived, I think, two days before the rebellion broke out, uh, was aware that Smuts was the linchpin to keeping South Africa loyal. He is as clever as he can stick, and always to the point, he explained to the British government, knows his own mind, clear and lucid, but he is somewhat secretive and non-communicative. And unlike both, I am never quite certain when discussing things with him how far he agrees with me. These are sentiments that David Lloyd George and other colleagues are going to express when he arrives in London in 1917. Smuts also recognizes that the key to containing the South African rebellion is to do so through its own resources. And so in October of 1914, when the rebellion is at its height, the British government offered to redirect the first contingent of the Anzac Division to South Africa rather than sending them to Europe informing them to keep this quiet, to keep this a secret from the, from the Australian and the New Zealand government. And Smuts declines, to do, <laughs> Smuts declines to do this, not necessarily because he doesn't think that they need the assistance. By this point, they're actually fortifying the government house in Pretoria. But rather, he recognizes that any overt interaction by either the British government or the Australian government, who he points out are deeply unpopular in, in South Africa, uh, would actually add fuel to the fire. And yet, at the same time, he works with the Admiralty <coughs> to keep this as a possible solution. They basically kind of uh, take a wide arc through the Indian Ocean in the event that the rebellion gets worse and they are needed. And this is the kind of backdoor negotiations that, 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 that are at play here in this rebellion and are going to be such a part of managing the war throughout the rest of the conflict. Finally, he brings the rebellion to bear by arranging not for a complete destruction in the field of the rebels, but by arranging for a complete amnesty for all, uh, all but the, the rebellion's leadership. And in fact, only one person is going to face uh, uh, the firing squad, and this is a, a relatively minor officer who forgot to resign his commission before going into rebellion. Uh, most of the, the Afrikaner rebels uh, are arrested and serve less than a year's term. Most of the actual rank and file are freed on their own recognizance. And, and, and I think that this, if, if you particularly if you compare this to what happens in 1916 after the Dublin, uh, Dublin uprising, this is a, this is a, a remarkable <coughs> demonstration of the way in which, at least early in the war, the British government was wise enough to empower those nationalists that would still maintain some type of connection. And Smuts certainly falls into that category. <coughs> Smuts took an active role in, 19, uh, in 1916 in the Imperial military war effort. In early 1916, he was offered and accepted the command of the faltering East Africa campaign. This was only fair as it was seen at the time because the vast bulk of soldiers, particularly those reinforcements, were South African. But he assumed a messy campaign that was a ragtag army of British, Indian, Rhodesian, South African, Belgian, uh, soon to be Portuguese troops and faced an inhospitable terrain, disease, and a wily commander in von Lotto Vorbeck. Now, I'm interested here less in Smuts's actual use as a field commander, but rather the reputation, which I think actually is quite key here. Smuts advocated aggressive raids like he had during the South African War, but not necessarily battles of annihilation. He employed what might be considered an anaconda strategy, a sort of uh, 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 squeezing together and, and, and the, 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 the pushing off of main terrain of, 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 of the German army, drawing them away from Mount Kenya, and being criticized heavily by many of the British commanders in his army, particularly Meinsgarten, his intelligence commander. He never beat the German army in battle, at least not in a serious engagement, but he did deplete the army and he did push it away from much of its main supply chain. <coughs> 
And by the end of 1916, he was able to declare uh, uh, somewhat presumptuously mission accomplished. And, uh, and of course, the campaign will continue on throughout 1918. But what's fascinating to me is the way, particularly after a year of the Somme, of Mesopotamia, of, 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 of the year before Gallipoli, the way that this is viewed in the British Empire as a successful campaign. And so Smuts and many other Dominion figures, Billy Hughes, uh, Massey in New Zealand, Robert Borden in Canada, began to be identified in the British press and in the British public as the antidote to inaction. This from a, uh, uh, a group of, <coughs> excuse me, from a group of suffragettes. We earnestly beg the government in view of the real and glorious part that the overseas states have played and the imperishable chapters that they have added to the British military annuals to avail itself now to the practical wisdom of colonial statesmanship, which has a genius for getting things done, the cooperation of which cannot fail to strengthen the imperial crisis or uh, cause. And I think the most illustrative uh, uh, was from uh, Admiral Jackie Fisher, who in 1916 wrote a letter to several uh, uh, individuals advocating Australia's Billy Hughes as prime minister, putting both in at the war office and replacing Haig with Jan Smuts. He later in admitted in a letter to Smuts that, quote, Smuts in France and both at the war office, and the Germans so puzzled that they're stabbing them in the back instead of attacking them as desired by the Germans in the front, and Smuts would walk along the seashore to Antwerp, covered by the British fleet, and would land a million Russians on the Pomeranian coast. <laughs> Very mad, I admit, it's the mad things that come off as war. One, one could only imagine Jackie Fisher with a Twitter feed um, during the First World War, but this, I think, speaks to the degree to which particularly the press and, 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 and critics of, of, of the Asquith uh, government were identifying figures like Smuts as the necessary type of, 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 of powerful masculine colonial men, this sort of better Britain's discourse it's, uh, of the late Victorian period, as the ways in which these were the individuals with the, with, the, with, the, with the skills and the practical wisdom to win the war. This type of... Uh, this type of turn against British leadership and a desire to bring the dominions into the greater councils of empire was one of the primary motives for the convening of the 1917 Imperial Conference. Now, the Imperial Conference system had been regularized in 1907 with an idea that it would meet every two years, that it was intended to meet in 1914 to handle naval defense issues in the Pacific, but had been postponed because of the war, and then Asquith refused to convene one in 1915, subsequently refused to convene one again in 1916. But in 1917, with David Lloyd George now at the helm, uh, the, the Imperial Defense Conference was, was, was organized as a way of bringing key personalities from the empire together for a vast var variety of reasons. But as Leo Ramery explained, the urgent thing is to get the half dozen or so strongest men in the empire together to make sure first of winning the war and then not allowing that victory to be thrown away in the peace negotiations. Smuts went to London in 1917 in lieu of Botha. Uh, both his health was in decline, as well as the fact that South African politics would not allow for his departure for the several months that it would require. And indeed, Smuts, Smuts left East Africa and went directly uh, to London uh, uh, with, with a considerable degree of trepidation. He had been warned by many of his colleagues in South Africa to, to be careful not to get enmeshed into the sort of octopus tentacles of British politics. But when he arrived in London in, in late January of 1917, he quickly realized that the three major features, the three major goals of the Imperial De War Conference would involve him quite, quite closely. And in fact, he will be the dominating figure of the Dominions, despite the fact that he is the sole non-prime minister in attendance in 1917. The first, and I think probably the one that we tend to most often overlook, is the role in which the Imperial War Conference is seen as a way to solve the Irish question. Now, I'd be happy to talk at length about this uh, in, in further detail during the Q&A. Uh, but the Irish question, uh, the, the, the role in which the, the fallout from the Easter Rising play, had, had re repercussions throughout the empire, case in point, the referendum in, in Australia in 1916, pointed to the degree in which these dominion figures were seen as more neutral arbiters who might be able to come in and deal with the Irish question from an imperial perspective. 
Norcliffe and his allies in the press, as well as several figures in the British government, began to assess the ways in which Dominion figures could come together and form what was called a commission of inquiry, to go to Dublin, to meet with Sinn Féin, and to find some way of breaking through and finding compromise. But at the same time that they were doing that, Irish revolutionaries were also approaching. And so when Smuts arrives, there's this fascinating sort of interplay in his papers where he arrives in London and Milner, uh, his old adversary from South Africa, comes knocking and wants him to go to Ireland and fix things. And then the next day, next day a, a delegation from Sinn Féin comes with the same goal. These, these, these individuals are seen as, as, as personalities who have the popularity <coughs> on both sides to be able to come in and offer a fresh face. Um, Northcliffe, in particular, is whipping up this, and he even claims to have met with Sinn Féin and has, has suggested that Smuts be put in charge of an actual commission. It is a question not of weeks, but of days to get this Irish question settled, he says. Ultimately, David Lloyd George offers Smuts in 1917 to chair an Irish convention that is going to be founded on the same format as the convention that led to the Union of South Africa in 1917. And Smuts comes very, very close to accepting it until his old roommate from Cambridge, who is now a bishop in Northern Ireland, writes him a very long letter and explains just what the, the sort of quagmire, the political repercussions of sticking his neck too far into Irish politics without any prior experience. Smuts also has his eye on a field command. And so in 1917, he declines this. Now, he will come back and play a very important role in Irish politics in 1921. Again, something I'd be happy to answer your questions about. The second element is the way in which the Dominions are going to shape British military policy. The Dominions demanded more voice in military policy, particularly in the aftermath of 1916, but evidence suggests that Lloyd George saw the Dominions as important personalities in his ongoing war with the Chief Brass. And so early in the conference, Smuts showed that he would take the lead among Dominion statesmen in cementing a sort of colonial view of military policy. Now, where Smuts differed from much of his political and military uh, contemporaries is his view towards the total war. Smuts did not believe in the need for a knockout blow, and this is something that's going to determine his, his views on strategy, it's going to determine his views on the evolution of the empire, and it's certainly going to determine his views on the peace process in 1919. But he also recognized uh, the need to, or he also believed in the need to explore alternative avenues for placing pressure on Germany. His idea of military strategy was predicated on a political result of bringing the German government to an arbitrated peace. And so therefore, Smuts was uh, sort of an early adherent to what we might think of as an Easterner in this great debate between Easterners and Westerners. And so not surprisingly, in March 1917, just as the conference was getting uh, started, Lloyd George sent him to France on a fact-finding mission where he met with British and French generals, talked at length with Haig, with Robertson and the chief of uh, Imperial General Staff. Haig and Robertson believed that Smuts was somebody that could be converted to their turn. And in fact, Ro Robertson writes a letter that's in Haig's papers that, quote, Smuts has come back from you full of good ideas, and he is horrified to find how we are dancing attendance upon the French he is a great asset here, and I only hope we may get things more to our liking before he has to leave. And indeed, Smuts does come back uh, uh, and, 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 and rather reluctantly becomes an adherent to the Passchendaele Offensive. In 1917, he says, to relinquish the offensive in the third year of the war would be fatal and would be the beginning of the end. But this does not necessarily reflect Smuts' ideas for a knockout blow. Rather, to keep up pressure on Germany pending an eventual sort of uh, defeat of Germany and other theaters. The third element of this, though, is the way in which Smuts began to articulate a vision of empire that was uh, uh, very much at odds with a sort of pre-First World War idea of imperial federation. <coughs> Robert Borden, the Canadian Prime Minister, initiated a conversation for greater dominion consultation <coughs> in foreign policy and often is attributed to being the one that's, that sort of initiated this. But it's Smuts that actually provides the intellectual and philosophical understanding of just what an Imperial War Conference means. He drafted a resolution in the Imperial War Conference, one passed unanimously, I should add, uh, uh, calling for a post-war conference to reconsider the future 
Empire, or what he began to term the, quote, imperial commonwealth. However, his more famous pronouncement came in May when he was invited to speak before both houses of parliament and gave a speech in which he denied that the British Empire was a traditional authoritarian empire. And of course, here we see him separating the, the, the settler colonies from that of the, the, the broader empire. Germany is an empire, he says. Rome was an empire. India is an empire. And so here again, we see this kind of differentiation between, between what he sees as the sort of uh, organic cultural racial uh, bonds between, between white populations and that of the, the broader empire. But we are a system of nations. This is the fundamental fact we have to bear in mind, that the British Commonwealth does not stand for standardization or denationalization, but for the richer, or fuller, richer, and more various life of all the nations that are composed of it. Smuts's ideas then of a British Commonwealth, um, it's a, this, these, are, these are ideas that, that are being advanced in other areas, but I think it's important here to know that, that this, is, this is, again, the, one has to sort of recognize the irony of somebody who 16, 15 years earlier was actively fighting against the British Empire. And so for many, this speech in 1917 was a defining moment that spoke to a set of potential, an idea of an empire that could reconcile individuals within a broader framework. It, it's a move away then from this more Victorian racialized idea of empire. Racialized in the sense of it being British, not racialized in the sense of it being white. Because what Smuts is advancing is an empire based on liberal mid 19th century vision of, of, of white Anglo-Saxon states. So this is again very much predicated in a, in a, in a vision of empire based on, on, on race, but a more elastic version of race, one that can incorporate uh, uh, the Boers as well as the British. Smuts came to London in 1917 for what he thought would be a two to three month uh, visit and ultimately did not leave until the fall of 1919. Became a member of the war cabinet, became Lloyd George's fixer. Uh, he had a significant impact on British military policy and the peace <coughs> treaty. And as the conference began to wind down, Lloyd George began to consider ways to retain him. He did this first by offering him the Palestine Command, the opportunity to replace Murray. This was the opportunity that in many ways Smuts had been waiting for. This is why he turned down the Irish Convention. This is an opportunity to take his ideas of mobile warfare and of, and of a sort of uh, uh, Eastern theater approach. But he was also convinced by other members of the British government, and particularly Robertson, that, the, that this was a, a sort of, uh, uh, this was not something that Lloyd George was ever going to be serious about and that the, the Eastern Theater was never going to acquire the necessary resources to offer him the type of opportunities he wanted. Nonetheless, Lloyd George decided to keep him around. He saw him as somebody who could provide the military credentials uh, uh, and the colonial credentials, he's sort of the best of two worlds, to be able to serve as an advisor and in particular to, to, to sort of counter the weight of Robertson, of Haig, and of others. Lloyd George uh, said of him later in his memoirs that he is, quote, one of the most remarkable personalities of his time. He is that fine blend of intellect and human sympathy which constitutes the understanding man. And this next part, I think, is actually quite interesting. Smuts was a standing disproof of the theory tenaciously held by the British War Office, despite the classic example of Oliver Cromwell to the contrary, that no one was competent to hold military command without long uh, training, sorry, <laughs> training, uh, long training in the regular army, the career of General Smuts furnishes a practical demonstration of that, of the absurdity. Now Smuts uh, and Lloyd George became very, very close during the course of the war. And in fact, the absence of, much uh, absence of much correspondence in both Lloyd George's papers and Smuts's papers speaks to the way in which they were in, in fairly personal contact almost every day. Smuts then, uh, and this is just a partial list, but Smuts was assigned to be a, a, a sort of handyman, if you will, of, of the imperial war effort from 1917 <laughs> through about mid-1918 and was placed in all types of positions. For example, in July of 1917, he co-chaired the Air Organization Committee, which ultimately produced a report calling for uh, the, the creation of an independent Royal Air Force. I was, in, uh, I was in London in June during the 100th anniversary of the, uh, the RAF. I did not see a single 
mention of Jan Smuts's role in the creation of the RAF, um, but this, I think, is actually something that's, that's quite prominent. Uh, here again speaks to this irony that a former Boer general is creating, uh, is, is, is chairing a report that is going to lead to the creation of the RAF. He was enormously useful in dealing with dissent, and this was in part because of his background as an enemy of capitalism as it's personified on the Rand and in Diamond Magnets, and as, as, as somebody who every weekend surrounded himself with suffragettes, uh, with, with activists, anti-war activists like Emily Hobhouse, he had a very odd uh, cadre of, of, of friends that he would spend the weekends with. And so Lloyd George used him in negotiations with labor activists, with, uh, with anti-conscription activists, uh, pacifists, socialists, etc. One of my favorite examples was in September of 1917, when, uh, I'm sorry, October of 1917, when he goes to Wales to, to attempt to break a massive whale, uh, Welsh coal strike. Uh, and the account is that he goes before this angry crowd and he says, gentlemen, I come from far away, as you know. I do not belong to this country and I have a long way to do in my bit in this war. And I'm going to talk to you tonight about this trouble. But I have heard in my country that the Welsh are amongst the greatest singers in the world. And before I start, I want you, first of all, to sing me some songs, the songs of your people. And then they break out in song, the land of my fathers, after which they give him this, this standing ovation. He gives basically a repeat of the same speech he gave in Parliament in May of 1917. And as, as, as legend would have it, the, uh, they, they come to a compromise and go back to work. Now, again, how much of this is, is sort of uh, uh, glorified, I, I don't know. But the point is that Smuts becomes a very sort of PR-friendly character that the British government can, can bring out at times. Uh, the last element of this, though, that I'll, I'll bring up uh, before moving on is, is the way in which Lloyd George uses him as a sort of inspector of military strategy, sending him, for example, uh, to Italy in 1917, sending him to uh, uh, the Middle East to confer with Allenby in early 1918, and most famously in January of 1918 when he is dispatched to France with the mission to find an alternative to Hague. And he comes back and tells a very disgruntled Lloyd George that, that he can't find one, and thus the war continues on. Time will permit me, uh, will not permit me to talk about his, his activities in 1918 in conjunction with, with Billy Hughes and with, with Borden of Canada. Um, there is an interesting sort of side story to tell about this, though, and this is something that I've been, been working on in, in, in this section of the book. The degree to which these three prime ministers in, in say, May and June and July of 1918 worked with Lloyd George to begin uh, challenging the, the need for a knockout blow on the Western Front. They ultimately pro co require a, uh, or, uh, command the, uh, the war, war Office to produce a report calling for uh, a more diverse sort of varied approach to the war, but also with the understanding that at the time that this was going to last until 1920, they began to, to try and find ways to, to uh, bring Haig and to, to uh, sort of clamp down on his, on his ability to, to, to lead on his own. Um, Ultimately, the, the collapse of the German army sort of renders this report null and void. But this is sort of an interesting side story to be able to talk about. But by the middle part of 1918, Smuts had abandoned much of these sort of imperial missions as a fixer and began to work uh, towards, towards preparing Britain for the peace process. And in fact, he dominated the briefs, the various reports that were put together preparing Britain for uh, the Versailles Treaty as early, actually, as, as July of 1918. And here again, his very curious ideas about political philosophy, about liberalism, and a, and a Wilsonian world order clash with his very racist ideas of, of Anglo-Saxon, I'm sorry, of, of, of white supremacy, of sovereignty, and of empire. On the one hand, he was one of the ravenous, quote, colonial imperialists that Robert Cecil complained about that were trying to gobble up places like Samoa, Germany, East Africa. And you can see Smuts's early campaigns in the First World War with his idea of a greater South Africa is playing into this. But on the other hand, he wanted greater internationalization. He was a proud supporter of the League of Nations. And al alone, for the most part, amongst the British Empire delegation, he promoted a very generous treatment of Germany. He put his ideas forward in a memo right before the conference that reflected his ideal ideology, not just about an evolving empire, but an evolving world order. 
which meant Anglo-American cooperation. This means that we must, from the very start of the conference, cooperate with America, he said, and encourage and support President Wilson as far as is consistent with our own interest. In doing so, we are only following the line of our true policy for the future, which will no doubt link the two great democratic commonwealths in a common destiny. Language, interest, and ideals alike mark them out for political comradeship and the great developments of the future. He also, I think, provided my own, an answer to my own question at the beginning of the process, why the British Empire held together, at least his vision of the way this works, was because of the elasticity of the Commonwealth. In a rudimentary way, he said, all such composite empires of the past were leagues of nations, keeping the peace among the constituent nations, but unfortunately doing so not on the basis of freedom, but of repression. These empires have all broken down, and today the British Commonwealth of Nations remains the only embryo League of Nations because it is based on the true principles of national freedom and political decentralization. Now, I want to be very clear. Smuts is not promoting a sort of post-45 liberal worldview of, 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 of empire. This is very much grounded in a Victorian understanding of racial supremacy. But I think it's fascinating the ways in which his 1917 writings on the Commonwealth and on this idea of an elastic liberal order of nations then becomes internationalized in 1919 as the League of Nations. So much so that David Lloyd <coughs> George writes him a letter in 1920 that effectively says, you know Woodrow Wilson stole your ideas. And his response was, that's fine, we got it accomplished. And so in a lot of ways, Smuts can perhaps more so than Woodrow Wilson be attributed as the father of the League of Nations. Smutsy and world moment just doesn't sound quite as attractive. <laughs> now time precludes a uh, sort of further discussion of Smuts's schedule in Paris where he dominated much of the British Empire delegation's agenda, successfully campaigned for the uh, 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 retention of German colonies, got on very, very well with Wilson, uh, uh, and, and ultimately is sent later in the uh, process to be sort of an emissary to Hungary um, and, and, and whatnot. But what then does where do we go from here? What, is, what does this suggest then about the nature of the British Empire? What can Smuts's a snapshot of Smuts's career tell us? Well, first, I, I would say that the relationship between Britain and the Dominions is at the very heart of the early 20th century empire. Now, now, 10 years ago, I think this would have been a bolder claim. I think we have, have you know, the field has moved in a sense that, that we now recognize this as being uh, a bit more perhaps uh, aware. But we need to understand this then as an evolving worldview. Despite the development of the dominions as independent nations, elites, and I would argue the public as well, but elites still cherish this conception of an Anglo-Dominion cooperation, a British Commonwealth of Nations, as Smuts called it, is crucial to the myriad geopolitical and internal challenges of the 20th century. Second, in order to understand this evolution, we need to look beyond the abstract legal or constitutional issues that an earlier generation of scholars looked at. If you go back and look at the historiography of the British Empire of the 1920s to the 1950s, it's often written by legal theorists, which is why it's collecting dust for the most part. Um, it's, it's, it, it looks into all types of principles and laws being passed, but the reality is that these in individuals in 1914 through 1919 improvised a system and then gave it legal sanction or constitutional framework after the fact. The sort of exigencies of war required a, what, what Leo Amory called a committee of public safety for the empire that will then set the foundation for the types of institutional, but more importantly, personal relationships that will undergird the Commonwealth. Third, this project, I hope, will uh, seek to complicate this kind of typical characterization of the empire as pitting British versus colonial interest, uh, this kind of idea of the Palms versus the Anzacs, if you on the one hand, each of the self-governing dominions had, were independent actors, and, and as I've been finding uh, in the last few days, uh, much of the animosity, at least in terms of the peace process, was not between Australia and Britain, but between Australia and New Zealand, for example, about competing claims in the Pacific. Each dominion, and India as well, which does play a role in, in, in my project, had their own concerns, domestic political trends, geopolitical considerations, and indeed imperialist impulses of their own. But on the other hand, because this is at the end of the day a project about individuals, 
Each, many of the individuals contained in this study do not fit neatly under the label of British or colonial. As Linda Colley reminds us, cultural and national identities are not like hats individuals can wear multiple ones at any one time. How do you characterize somebody then like Smuts? How do we characterize Andrew Boner Law, who of course is born and spends the first 14 years of his life in New Brunswick, Canada? People like Smuts and others had to deal with imperial and national, religious and cultural considerations, and their personal relationships demonstrate the degree to which imperial statesmanship was a Byzantine affair that intersected the global, the regional or the national, and indeed the local. And so to better understand the First World War and to crucially engage the study of the First World War with scholars in other fields, we need to understand it through the comparative lens of empire. We need to place the dominions back at the center of this imperial narrative in order to understand not a rise and fall narrative or a nationalist historiography, the war is a rite of passage, but rather a transformation of British imperialism with the locus of power being spread out amongst the various corners of the globe. Jan Smuts then, who is such a fascinating figure and a seeming anomaly in the pantheon of British statesmen, who, by the way, is not in this picture, um, <laughs> which I put this PowerPoint together last night and realized that, um, and I have, a, I have an idea of why I'll share with you during the Q&A, but, um, uh, but seemingly an anomaly in the pantheon of British statesmen, he begins to appear then more, is more emblematic of the type of transnational personalities that was necessary to weather the storm total war, the type of, of, of relationships then that perhaps differ from that of the Austro-Hungarian, Ottoman, and German Empire. Thank you.